All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started just so we stay on time. Uh, my name is Bob Tubbs. I'm the Associate Residency Director at Brown, and I wanted to thank all of you for coming out. I know it's been a long week. Uh, thank you for sticking in to the end to hear us talk about something that we're very passionate about, and that is the idea of presentation design. And I'm very fortunate to be joined by a very gifted group of educators today um, who are also very passionate about it. And I just want to give them a chance to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Michael. I'm from the University of Colorado. Michelle Daniel, University of Michigan. I'm Chris Merritt from Brown. Hi, I'm Rob Turf from Michigan. Erica Kokonos from Michigan. As you can see, we stack the deck with uh, participants here. So we unfortunately have nothing financially to disclose, um, but we are very passionate about this. And it's something that I think is very important in medical education. So why are we spending time with this? Why are we devoting a presentation at a big conference on how to give a presentation? And the answer is we're educators and we are expected to be able to present. We're expected to be able to teach our learners. And yet very few of us actually get any sort of formal instruction on how to do that effectively. And it's a mission that I took up years ago that I wanted to get better myself. And it's just, it's always a continual act to try and improve. All too often, you end up with a situation like this. My presentation lacked power and it has no point. I thought the software would take care of that. And that's unfortunately still very true. It was true back in the early 2000s when I started using PowerPoint and it still is today because PowerPoint makes it easy to do some really bad things in terms of presentation design. They are gr it's a great tool if it's used appropriately and we're gonna try and teach you some tips to do that appropriately. So to that end, our objectives today are pretty simple. We're gonna touch on a few key concepts that help inform the idea of presentation design, starting with um, cognitive load theory. We're gonna briefly introduce Richard Mayer and his 12 principles for multimedia design, which really draw a lot on cognitive load theory. And I'm gonna show you some real life examples of maybe some not so good slides, and if, how we can use those principles to maybe make them a little bit more effective in terms of knowledge transfer. So what is cognitive load theory? This is a huge topic. I could spend hours just talking about all the intricacies of this in and of itself, but I do think it's worth a very brief mention of just its core concept. And it really has to do with how we process information into memory. And at its base, it supposes that memory is actually subdivided up into different types. The first is sensory memory. And sensory memory is really on the front line of things. It's the input for this barrage of sensory information that we're getting every second of every day. And sensory memory is actually very good at picking out the things that are pertinent to the situation that you're in, filtering out all the stuff that's extraneous, and only forwarding the appropriate things to your working memory. For instance, as I'm standing here, if I really concentrate, I can feel the texture of the carpet under my shoes. But my sensory memory knows that doesn't really matter when I'm giving a presentation so it dumps it and it doesn't make it into my working memory. So it acts almost like a filter. Working memory is really like the CPU in your computer. It takes information and it starts to process it and make sense out of it and organize it. And it decides what's worth keeping and it then forwards it into long-term memory. Where in long-term memory, it's like the hard drive. It organizes it and it fits it into schema that your mind or your brain is then able to further organize, form relationships with other schema. It can feed back into working memory to build new relationships. And this is really the essence of how we form memory. The problem is your working memory has a pretty finite bandwidth. You think of it as like the old time computers from like the early 80s and 90s. It doesn't have a lot of working memory. And pretty often, if you <laughs> give it too much, you overload it and it's not able to process and you lose information that way. Most experts would say, I've seen ranges anywhere that working memory, working memory can handle anywhere from uh, four to nine bits of discrete information or knowledge at a time. You know, me personally, I'm probably more on the four end of things, certainly as I get older, but anything more than that and it gets overloaded and it can't forward it onto long-term memory. So 
our goal when we design a presentation is to try and decrease the extraneous load on our working memory, not overload it, and only give it the key concepts that we want it to process. Right? So that's sort of the underpinning of how we use cognitive load theory. The dual channel theory of multimedia learning has to do with that sensory memory and how information gets fed into it. And there's a lot of thought that there are multiple sensory channels in that memory. An, a visual channel, an auditory channel, there's actually a third, a kinesthetic channel, but usually that's not really pertinent in a presentation. For our purposes, we think about the visual and the auditory channels. They also have fairly limited bandwidth. You can easily overload either one of them. You think about, if any of you who are here are parents, you think about coming home from a busy day at work and you got your kids all starting to talk, your spouse is starting to talk, and pretty soon it sounds like that Charlie Brown teacher, you know, it's like wah, 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 and you're like, you can't process anything. That's because you're overloading a single channel. But what they found is that if you stimulate both channels, that it can actually be additive and can actually uh, increase knowledge transfer and retention. So if you stimulate your auditory and your visual channel at the same time, it's actually beneficial. So again, as we design our presentation, we're going to do everything we can to maximize stimulation of both of those channels and not overload any single one. Does that make sense to people? Enter Richard Mayer. So back in the 80s, he developed 12 principles for multimedia design. And he draws very heavily on these ideas of cognitive load theory and the dual channel theory. And he came up with these principles to help form evidence-based guidelines for effective presentation. And there is actually science to back it up. These have been pretty well studied. And they have been shown in medical students and residents to help increase both knowledge transfer and retention in the short term and the longer term. So there is science behind this. It's not just us spouting opinion. So these are the 12 principles, and this slide alone violates pretty much all of them, so I'm not going to have you look at that because it's a little overwhelming. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take some time and show you some real examples, and I'm going to highlight some of those principles. We're not going to go through all 12. Some of them are more relevant than the others, but I'm going to try and hit the high-yield ones and show you how we can use those. So who here has seen something like this? Who here has done something like this? Who here has seen and done something like this in the last like two weeks, right? <laughs> PowerPoint makes it really easy. This is about as bad as it gets, right? Stock blue background, a lot of distractors. And when people present, they stand here. Case number one, chest pain. The patient is a 28-year-old male presenting with sudden onset chest pain. Pain started approximately two hours prior to arrival. The pain is 10 out of 10, sharp, pleuritic, and constant. Oh my god, right? This is torture. So enter the principles. And the first one is the coherence principle. And they're in your handouts, too, if you want to refer to them later. But what the coherence principle says is that we want to decrease that extraneous load on our working memory. And we want to eliminate anything that does not directly relate to the key concept that we're trying to get across. So there was a lot of extra stuff on this slide. Like, he's not even young. He's an old guy with chest pain. Like, why is he on there? You know, all these distractors, they're extraneous. So we want to get rid of them. We want to simplify. So if I was going to give a talk on chest pain or a case review, I would start with something like this. This very quickly gets the point across that this is a young guy having chest pain. He's gripping his chest. All right? He's very visually stimulating. And I could say very quickly, we have a 28-year-old male presenting with sudden onset, sharp substernal chest pain. It's pleuritic, 10 out of 10, and it started two hours prior to arrival gets everyone on the same page. You're listening to me, so we're stimulating the auditory channel, and you're looking at this graphic, which is stimulating your visual channel, and it's symbiotic. All right. So coherence principle, keep your slides simple. Eliminate all the extraneous stuff off of it if you can. Focus on one concept per slide. It's very tempting to just dump as much information onto a slide as you can. And there are all these silly rules that are still getting propagated out there in terms of like the number of slides that you should have for a presentation. Like I'm still hearing, you know, no more than 60 slides for a 60-minute talk, et cetera, et cetera. That's all bunk. 
I've given talks at ASAP that are over 500 slides in an hour, and I've given 50-minute talks that are three slides. It doesn't matter. What matters is the concepts you're trying to get across and try and keep it simple. Here's another example. So this is the Captain Morgan technique for hip reduction. Has anyone ever done this? It's really cool. But when you present it like this, the Captain Morgan method for hip reduction, number one, administer adequate analgesia. Number two, place operator's leg in patient's stretcher. You're like, that's boring. So enter the multimedia principle. And what the multimedia principle states is that if you add in graphics to text, it becomes a much more powerful message and much easier for your mind to process. So we add in a graphic. We clean up some of that extraneous background stuff, again, coherence principle. We add in a graphic, at least of Captain Morgan, so you get a sense for what the technique sort of looks like. But it's still very busy. It's still a lot of extraneous load. So what can we do to improve that? You know, at the end of the day, you're like, what am I putting where? You know, it's everyone's lost. So we can use the redundancy principle. And what the redundancy principle <laughs> says is you do better with graphics and narration than you do with graphics, narration, and text. And the reason behind that is when you put words up in front of somebody, it is human nature that they're going to start to read them. You cannot avoid it. This was very apparent to me when I was at my dad's house. He's pretty deaf and he closed captioned the TV. And I'm watching Star Wars, which I've seen probably a million times, and I'm reading the captioning. And it was really distracting and really annoying. What happened, you would think though, that having that slide with Captain Morgan in the text, well that's visual, and I'm narrating it, so that should be auditory, right? So it should be additive. But the reality of it is, is when you start reading text, even though it's coming in through your eyes, your brain is speaking it in your head, and what you're actually doing is listening to the voice in your head. Sometimes it's good, sometimes not so good, but in this case, you're listening to your the voice in your head read that text, and it converts that from a visual input to an auditory input, which is then directly competing with your presenter who's reading that same material. The other thing is you read much faster in general than your presenter should be speaking. And so again, it gets into that Charlie Brown idea, wah, 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 and it's not getting adequately conveyed. So what we can do is we eliminate the text as much as possible, eliminate the redundancy. And we can combine it with what's called the modality principle. And I could say, you put your knee up on the stretcher, you place a patient's leg across your knee, exert upward traction at the popliteal fossa, downward traction over the tibia, and feel for the clunk. And in 10 seconds, I have given you a very visual representation of that I've narrated it, and I can guarantee a week from now, you will remember that slide. And you could go and do that technique. All right, it's a very, very powerful tool. More examples. Again, very standard slide. We see these all the time, Ottawa ankle rules. I'm watching you guys, and I'm watching your eyes do this, because you're reading the text, right? You cannot help it. So I could sit here and read it with you, or, we could use the temporal contiguity principle, which means bringing stuff in at my defined pace, keeping you with me. And so we do that oftentimes with animation. And you have to be a little careful with animation, particularly when you first start. There's some really flashy things out there, like fireballs exploding and you know things swooping in. And it's really exciting to do that. You think it keeps people's attention. But it doesn't. It's extraneous load. You know, you look at this and it's really, really distracting and takes away from the concept that I want you to get. So it's not all bad, but keep it simple. So how we can fix this is narrate in the text or animate in the text one at a time using a simple animation like appear or fade. And this way I can speak it at the same time that you're seeing it and it keeps everyone together and it's much more cohesive. It's still ugly though. All right, we can do better than this. And so if we include something called the signaling principle, which is where you as the presenter highlight in either an auditory or a visual fashion the concept in relation to the slide, 
it makes it much more likely to stick. So here, and it, using the multimedia principle as well, I'm giving you a picture of an actual foot and ankle. I'm narrating in the text one at a time and cueing you as to where that text relates. So pain or tenderness over the medial lateral mouth, navicular tenderness, so on and so on. So it becomes a much more visually stimulating way of doing it and you're much more likely to remember it. And so we're gonna end up with this one and it's gonna bring in a lot of these concepts I do a lot of lecturing on radiology, that's sort of my academic niche. And nothing gives me angina more than seeing a slide like this. Because this is just god awful. There's so many distractors on this slide. Horrible stock background, lots and lots of text, horrible image, it hasn't been edited or cropped or anything like that. We could do so much better with this. And so, if we use the coherence principle, we make it very simple. We focus on one concept per slide. We use the multimedia concept. We use a nice high quality graphic. We use uh, the signaling principle, all right? Temporal contiguity, I'm, t I'm bringing you in at my pace. I'm showing you where this exactly relates to the image, all right? We're using all these principles at the same time and it makes things much more effective. You'll notice I split that one slide up into multiple slides. It takes about the same amount of time to get through but now it's a much more visually effective way of doing it. So these are all just sort of tongue-in-cheek examples of it, but they're still out there and we can do better. And so if you take home a few points from this, like I said, you have your handouts, they have Mayer's principles in there. Keep things simple, all right? Really try and keep it as simple as possible. Focus on just one idea per slide and make sure your learners get that one point. Use visuals to reinforce your concepts. Graphics are always going to be better than text, all right? But make sure that they're relevant graphics. Keep the audience at your pace. Introduce concepts in your time. Keep them with you. And if you take nothing else out of this, minimize the text as much as possible. If you can do that one step alone, you will be leaps and bounds ahead of the crowd and you'll be doing your learners a huge service. So that was sort of a whirlwind tour. Like I said, we didn't hit all of his principles, but we hit a lot of the big ones, and I think you guys got some of the concepts. And what we would like to do now is split you guys up into groups, and you can do it sort of geographically into four or five groups. And for those of you with computers, we've given you some handouts there. In those handouts are a couple of cases, and they're sort of stock, like one's altered mental status, one is chest pain. With the information that we want you to get across to your learners, and we've given you sort of conventional slides, how it would appear in a lot of places. And we want to stimulate you guys to think about how you could use the principles to improve them and what it would look like. So if you have a computer, that's great. You can mock up a couple of slides. If not, flip the page over and sort of visually draw out what you think it would look like. And we're going to circulate the room and do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with you guys and walk you through some of these concepts. Anyone have any questions right now? Yes. You give them a separate handout. So PowerPoint is not a handout. It's evolved that way because it's easy and a lot of even like ASAP and a lot of the big programs prefer your slides to match your handouts. But a basic concept is if you can get everything you need by just reading the slides, then it should be a handout and it shouldn't be a presentation because the presentation is the marriage of the presenter presenting the material. And if they get everything they can off the slide, then you're wasting their time. So give it to them as a separate handout. It would be my advice. It's a little bit more work, but it's much more effective in the end for everyone. There's a, there's a great book by a guy named Gar Reynolds if you want some nice reading on presentation design. And his famous quote is, handouts set you free. They like liberate you from having to dump everything on the slide that nobody's gonna remember anyway. But it allows you to really focus on the few key concepts that you wanna get across during the presentation. So, yes, sir. Uh, so, like, you talked about it earlier, you kind of pick out the areas that are just the, 
Um, I buy most of my images. Um, there's a bunch of royalty-free sites out there. I use Canstock Photo is the one that I use the most. Um, but if you just Google uh, royalty-free sites, there are also a number of free ones as well um, that have pretty high-quality images. The other thing you can do, and we were going to talk about this in the smaller groups, is when you Google search for images, if you, when you type in the image and pull up Google Image, at the top there will be either a tools or a setting option. If you look in there under advanced search, it allows you to search by size to get high quality, high resolution images. And as a minimum when you're presenting, you want a minimum of 1024 by 720 DPI is sort of the standard minimum size that you would get to be able to size the images. That feature in Google also allows you to sort by usage rights. So, you know, a lot of images are copyrighted, which is why I buy most of my own images now when I do national presentations. For in-house stuff, Google is fine. But you can sort in there for Creative Commons, you know, free images in Google as well.